Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me in another of my wonderful interviews. Are you somebody who's um, gone into a, I don't know, a shop or, or been looking at a catalogue and something about the logo of that company has caught your, caught your eye and you've gone, oh, that's an interesting design or that's strange. I wonder why they've done that. That has no bearing to the name of the, the company. Or are you somebody who's just been fascinated in the way they put certain words into certain things? Well, I'm going to talk to a very, very lovely graphic designer who has, and I guess that's his job, is designing logos and those sort of things and can tell us a lot more about what goes on with that sort of thing than we possibly even could imagine. His name is Paul Oldman and he's going to tell us a little bit about understanding the system through, through graphics, I suppose. Uh, hello, hello, Paul. Hello. <laughs> It's lovely to have you on the show. Now, I've made a, a, a few assumptions there because we were talking beforehand and you're a graphic designer. You were talking about logos. I, I'm making the assumption that that's what you do. You design logos for people. I do design logos um, and corporate literature and things like that. Um, I won't be talking about very much of that in today's um, talk. Um, it's a bit more about legal terminology. But okay. hopefully in the future, um, if possible, I can... Uh, talk about that because I think visually I think it's a really interesting area um, but, but but just before we leave that I mean I know that we spoke briefly yes there are certain things in logos that that are put in there specifically that we might not recognize but certain people in the know would is would is that a sort of fair thing yes I've kind of learned along the way that there's quite a lot of um, modern corporate uh, design in logos that essentially does well, it's kind of doing two things at once. Um, for the people who don't know or are not kind of attuned to, to seeing certain things, they will see the logo very much at face value. For others who are probably more in the know, not people like me, but um, people in the club, will um, recognise other elements that are placed into the logo. And they're kind of invisible signatures to you and me. Um mm. They're kind of signatures, nonetheless, to tell people essentially who's in the club and who's not. And um, um, in addition to that, there's an awful lot of uh, what would be regarded as ancient theological symbology that's found its way into logo design. So that kind of um, the world of symbology and signs has kind of found its way into modern corporate logos as well so um yeah I'm, i can kind of pre prepare a presentation on that possibly in the future well, that that yeah no that would be interesting i'm sure people would be fascinated uh, because again it's that sort of thing it's hidden in plain sight yes exactly and unless you know how to read which is what we're going to be actually talking about um then like all things it just passes over you and it's a pretty picture or it's just yeah. a, you know an interesting curve on a letter or something yeah. and it's fairly meaningless yes brilliant okay well that i think that's something that we will look forward to however um <laughs> also hidden in plain sight are words and the use of words and we've spoken a little bit about this on the show uh in the past so I know that you put together a little presentation to take us through. Did you want to explain a little bit about how this has come about with with you, how you've become familiar with these sort of things? Um, I think, you know, for some time I've kind of uh, watched um, what some people might regard as quite kind of boring and technical kind of presentations by people who've kind of taught themselves legalese. Like all of us, we kind of get little snippets from what I call kind of gurus, you know, along the way. And um, some of the people that I've watched aren't actually from the UK. They're probably a bit less familiar maybe to, than, than some. Um, and they, you know, in, in some regards have kind of got to the, got to the nub of possibly how the system works through words. And I've kind of gleaned a few bits and bobs of information that I've just put down here and uh, part of the reason really for kind of um, contacting you was that because some of these things come from, you know, so Australia or New Zealand or whatever, um, they might be less um, 
known to people in the UK. So I thought, well, just put them down. Mm. I'm no legal expert, and obviously this is not legal advice. Um, it's just kind of, there are small snippets of information. They're like dots, you know, that we kind of connect and uh, some other people to a degree who are much more um, knowledgeable about this would be in a position probably to fill in some of the areas that I, I know very little about. But I think one thing I could say is that some of the things that I've seen do kind of hang together and they do kind of open your eyes a little bit about potentially how the, the kind of system works. So um, i muddle through this, but I, I'm, I've never done it before. I'm not an expert in the same way as, say, people like Sovereign Empowerment are. Um, and these aren't legal remedies either. They're just little bits of information. And in a way, they're kind of... Um, sometimes when you see how things are done in Australia or New Zealand, um, they're, they're basically systems that are used and then you have to kind of find whether they're using the same system in the UK. Sometimes you can see it and as you'll probably see occasionally you can't they're there but it you know who's got the time to try and unearth some yes. of things so and, um, and i guess like most things as we said with the logos you cast your eye over, over something and on the surface level it seems perfectly fine yeah. but if you if you're just aware that oh hang on a minute i watched that presentation with that very nice chap paul and oh there's that word or there's that phrase or there's this that might make you, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's like when you've bought a car and you suddenly notice all the other cars that are similar to yours yeah. and, and it suddenly starts to stick out. So we're, we're going to be presenting dots and hopefully joining them up in our minds. So um, shall I? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, please don't take it as legal advice because, you know, no. some of it might be wrong. But um, <laughs> as, far as, I, as far as I can see, one or two things might be, especially in the kind of um, economic climate useful to yes brilliant well i'll put the presentation up on the screen just bear with me as i do a couple of uh, little shenanigans down here on the computer to get hold of it there it is and it starts with learning to read yeah it kind of it sounds a bit of a strange thing to say but i think the problem with words is that we've we've gone through the schooling system we've been taught to read We've always been taught to read um, and our minds are very kind of quick at kind of grabbing minimal amounts of information to kind of form words and then form meaning. So sometimes we, we kind of almost fall over ourselves when we read mm. uh, we skip through things and our mind makes connections very quickly, even if we don't necessarily want them to. And it's almost impossible to, to stop sometimes. And I think some words that are used in the system kind of play on this. So um, yes, uh, there's one word in particular, I think, which is quite dangerous because it, it really does work on our kind of, we all automatically kind of respond to it. Right. So, okay. So, that, I mean, in terms of learning to read, I think it's kind of learning to unlearn what we already know and just be a bit more careful in, in how we read things. Yes. Absolutely, because we gloss over very easy. We're, we're pattern-seeking people, aren't we? And we see things and we th and we make the assumption, oh, yeah, that means that. Yes, and I think, like you say, with this kind of world of things being hidden in plain sight, um, they're there, but we kind of accept them on, on face value. Um, mm. So it's just about possibly being careful. And um, in a way, this is only a demonstration of what I've learned. I've, I've, I've got a few little dots along the way, as I said before, but is by no means comprehensive and uh, <laughs> hopefully it makes some kind of sense so fantastic should we go to the next slide yes, move on so i think kind of uh, having listened to some of your programs recently about council tax it mm. kind of inspired me to um go and read some actual government acts which i think probably absolutely none of us do um they all they kind of affect our lives in in well we're completely controlled by them um uh, but we never read them and uh, we don't really know how they're put together um i don't really know how they're put together but there are two or three things that um are apparent um and when you start to read government acts online and they're all there um it's apparent that 
there are, again there are kind, there's a kind of dual parallel system going on um that we'll read it and we will read those words which are kind of taken from common usage words that we recognize but they're amongst those statutes and acts there are words that kind of look like common everyday words but they're they're kind of masquerading in a way they're really legal terms that have got specific meanings and those specific meanings can be completely different to the everyday meaning of the word so um uh, <laughs> really we as individuals we should uh kind of be keeping an eye on what these things these acts that are kind of put into statute which are done on our behalf and of course we never do because we don't have the time no but i think maybe one or two of these words might be helpful um the problem is with government acts um these specific words or these kind of legal terms sometimes won't be pulled out typographically so you won't recognize them um as a specific term i.e they might not be in quote marks they might not be in bold or italic or whatever um, <clears throat> sometimes they're found in the, as a preamble to the act, but very often what they do to kind of put us off the scent is they'll hide those terms in other acts about other things, or they will sometimes um, put them in what are called interpretation acts, which don't come out very often, but essentially they're kind of dictionaries for acts that are then brought out later on that use these terms. All oh, so, right. Okay, so uh, they're called interpretation acts, and they will probably list these legal words and give them a meaning, and um, which is essentially a kind of reference point for the legal terms they use thereafter. Because essentially, if you don't put uh, a, a kind of dictionary with the words that you use, everyone will kind of take come away and take a different meaning from it. So the actual putting down definitions for legal terms or words that use an acts is really important, especially if it's mm. the law. So um, essentially that's where that comes from. So if we just move on to the next slide. I've just put down some kind of quick um, examples here. Down the middle there, you'll see kind of the context of where some of these words will be used. And um, the first one, which I, I said earlier on, was a word that's almost automatically built into us and that's the word you and i think yes. like all of us I'd, well some of us might get things like summons to court and debt collection letters and such like what happens is that uh, on the top of the letter you'll have your address and your which will usually be in um, either or all capital letters um which is the corporate name or or your christian names will be in upper and lower case um and your surname will be in uppercase. Um, so that kind of address is at the top, and that will obviously appear in the window of the letter. But below, in the main body of the letter, your le your name won't appear anymore. Um, they will just use the word you. So um, you are summoned, or you will get further information, or you will attend. And the thing about the word you is that if you imagine um, a room full of people and then you go through the door into that room and you say, hey, you, um, do you think one person is going to turn around or do you think lots of people are going to turn around? Yes, it's non-specific, isn't it? It's non-specific and it's a plural term. So um, it's a, it is a word essentially uh, to you create joinder to your legal fiction, which is your surname. So Right. And like I said before, the word you is used in all these documents. Now, it, sound, it, looks, it sounds a bit kind of obvious, um, but when I came across this, I, I got a um, parking ticket at a railway station two or three years ago, and um, it, it was incorrectly kind of issued. Um, I won't go into that, but what, what I did do is I thought I will use this as a kind of little bit of a test um with the collection agency and um on based on the word you so essentially they would say you owe xyz you owe us 100 pounds or 200 pounds or whatever um and i basically wrote back and said could you could you clarify uh who is you because i am not you mm. uh 
and that sounds very very kind of peculiar but um because they want you to voluntarily create that joinder through you to your legal fiction name that's at the top of the letter um this dispute went on for about well over a year um and they would not they would not address the point that i made in the letter which i thought was interesting in itself uh i never got a reply about who you was and in the end it was dropped now i don't know if <laughs> it could be dropped just because it took a year and they couldn't be bothered anymore but they did go on for a year chasing um hmm. and responding to letters that were essentially about can you clarify who you is um yes. so that's just one word to be aware of more usefully is um the word goods now you know if we come into contact with bailiffs you know we all, i think in your programs you've kind of highlighted that they don't really have any legal um way of kind of gaining access to the house but very often the word goods will come up and if we think it's things that are in our house that somebody can kind of come along and take and um goods aren't those things goods are things that we offer up for sale so if somebody comes to take our car or our table or a piece of furniture um as goods they're not goods because we haven't put them up for sale so that's one interesting oh, that's yes that's very interesting yes so when 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 things talk about goods and services you can see that they're things that are being traded yes uh, commerce exactly and and goods are being offered up for trade well you want to come and take my table or a piece of furniture that's not up, that's not being traded so it's right. not it's not good uh, please <laughs> somebody if somebody else knows better please tell me but that's my understanding of it um i think one very interesting thing is the word property um it's not and i think in today's kind of economic climate um repossessions are going to be possibly something that's going to be on the increase um one thing that i've kind of seen along the way and i don't know if you have but um the word property is kind of we kind of link that in our minds the word uh, or our house and the land it sits on and um obviously if we get into trouble with the mortgage the mortgage provider tries to basically evict us from the house sell and sell the house all based around the word property um but actually the mortgage provider only has an interest or a lien against our title deed so that's a piece of paper um and it's not the actual house itself so um what they will tend to do is they'll try and use intimidatory tactics to try and force you to leave the property um and once you leave the property what they will then do is try to claim the house as abandoned and then they'll be entitled to then change the title um and then resell it so <laughs> i think very cheeky that's cheeky so i think one thing i would kind of possibly suggest although it's not legal advice is that we never move from a property even if we're getting these kind of threatening letters or even people at the door um the mortgage company only has an interest in the title deed not the property or not the building itself right that's very interesting yes it's a bit of a shocker really um but what they do is obviously they rely on the fact that we don't know and we kind of give up that yeah. property and we voluntarily give it up and then they can come in and claim it somebody um somebody just to interrupt there somebody sent me a um a letter an email this morning as uh, as we record this uh, of what they were doing i've just got to get this straight in my mind they people in houses they're now deeming the house as not fit to live in and so they're trying to evict people because the house is not fit for living even though they bought it it's their own house and then of course they want to actually put in migrants into this house which is a very strange situation but presumably this is part of the repossessing and and if it's you know telling you you've got to move out of your property or you or they're claiming the property they're not actually talking about the actual house i would uh, all i would say is never abandon the property right don't move out there's i don't think i might be wrong but i don't think there's anything they can do 
if you don't move from the property. Um, and ultimately, um, as you'll see from this slide, um, the mortgage is a legal arrangement by which a bank or other creditor lends money at interest in exchange for taking title of the debtor's property with the condition that the conveyance of title becomes void upon payment of the debt. So the actual definition of mortgage tells you that they don't have an interest in the bricks and mortar. They just have an interest in the title deed. Mm. So, that's, yes. Yeah, so, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, please tell me somebody if I'm wrong, but um, that is basically the conclusion you can draw from that. Some other examples, which I've only kind of run learned recently um, and are a little bit more obscure um, is the word defendant. So essentially, um, we kind of step up, you know, in, in court situations and we we step up into essentially what is the acting, a, a kind of dramatic actor's office of yes. called defendant. And we, we kind of join with that as living people um, and we become the defendant. I mean, I've got a letter here where it's I am the defendant in a matter, so I can either decide to become that defendant or not. Um, mm. Once I do, then I fulfil that office. But the defendant is an officer of a deceased estate, and um, we'll probably come into that a little bit later on um, in a later slide. Right. Uh, crown, again, we see the word crown quite a lot, and obviously our first thought is to think about literally a crown, a king, a sovereign, the Queen, now the King. Um, but the Crown, from what I've seen in other presentations, um, is your surname. And it's the your surname is the estate of a deceased. So essentially, I will kind of go into that a little bit later on. Yeah. So um, in a way, the Crown estate is not what we think it is. Um, no. Let's leave it at that at the moment. <clears throat> okay. And name, obviously, on things like a birth certificate, um, we'll have Christian names and surnames. But um, I think in legal terms, a name is something that identifies a thing which is not a living person, uh, which is essentially a corporation. Um, in yeah. The world. So, um, you know, just things to be kind of careful of. Um, Absolutely, yeah, I, and I, I would agree on. Um, uh, I'm, it's interesting what you say about the defendant, but I would agree on the other two myself from stuff that I've uh, looked at. Oh, good, good. I'm not mad then. Right. No, no, not mad, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, the two big ones really are person, because you know we've we've talked about that before. Yes. I'm going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole because I think you've been talking about council tax, so I kind of went and had a look myself at that and very quickly it becomes very murky and rather it's kind of circular argument about what the definition of person is. Um, obviously in all acts and statutes, uh, we're all regarded as persons or persons. Um, and I think we all know the people who've done a little bit of studying on this kind of realize a person is a corporation. Yeah. But within say, for instance, the council tax, um, thing that you've been going through. Um, it's just interesting to see what that kind of means, because that, that does take us to a place where we could say we're not people. Um, but I would, I think if we went into court, we'd probably find ourselves kind of um, a rug might be pulled and a trick, a, you know, a trick pulled on us to, um, in terms of the a kind of subtext definition of the word person, which I'll kind of try and show you. And right, other, okay. And the other one, which is possibly even bigger, um, is the word includes, because um, I think you know this yourself. Yes. The word includes is used as a legal term in acts and statutes that are drawn up by government, but it doesn't mean what we think it means. And I think to a large extent, it's a word that you is, I, I think we could probably say that it's word used to deceive um not in a kind of obvious way but but because it's it's kind of built into legislation and most people don't read legislation 
they're kind of deceiving, but they're not lying, if you know what I mean. Um, it's a very yes. subtle distinction. Okay. Right. Let's move on. So what I did was, you know, you've been talking about the council tax, um, the local yep. finance act in 1992, and everything is in there in terms of liability to pay is is kind of written in terms of, well, who's liable to pay? Well, persons are liable to pay. I tried to simplify it this down because there are, you know, there are kind of sub terms like residents and, you know, individual mm. dwelling, but essentially they all come back to the word person. So I thought, right, okay, well, can I see what the word person means? So if we just go to the next uh, slide, um, what I found was the Interpretation Act 1889. Um, I think a lot of the, uh, in the 1800s, 1800s rather, a lot of the system was being set up and things were being changed. And um, I think if you kind of want to find the kind of origin of some of these systematic kind of devices, you can go back into Victorian times. If you're going back to the Interpretation Act, it's one of those acts, again, that I said there was a kind of dictionary where it sets out terms for the future. Right. So, so on the left hand side, you'll see in point 19, meaning of a person in future acts. So it says in this act and in every act that follows, yeah, that follows, um, blah, 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 include any body of persons, corporate or unincorporate. So to our see, ears, that doesn't sound like a real man or woman, does it? Yeah, no, but does unincorporate mean? Unincorporate. Um, I'll come on to that, but unincorporate really is um, you haven't formally uh, in you're, in, <laughs> you you're implied. So you're in pl an implied business or corporation rather than a uh, an officially recognised by, say, the government. Uh, you haven't registered as right. a company um, like a. So you might be a kind of society or a partnership. Right, but you're uh, not a living man or woman. Uh, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So that was that was essentially set up as the definition for the word person in Victorian times, and um, that was updated in 1978. So if we go to the next slide, another interpret. You can see how often they come out. Um, <laughs> they probably have, you know, there's a few per century, but yeah, uh, the 1978 Act um, essentially left that interpretation of person exactly the same as you can see in the brackets. Right. So includes a body of persons, corporate or unincorporate. Okay. So our reading from that would, would be a person includes a corporation or something that's like an incorporation, but not formally a corporation. Yeah. So not you and I then as living men and women. Not well, you're not a, you're not a living woman. I, at least I don't <laughs> think so. Uh, well, but you can never be sure. But I don't, I think you'll find we're not living men and women anyway. So, um, you know, but that's, it gets ever more technical. So, right. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the kind of, uh, the um, tricky thing here is not only are we dealing with these terms that, that mean other things. So you, you're kind of each word, you're trying to find a definition for that word. These um, definitions have kind of rules that, aren't defined but they're kind of ongoing truisms things what are called legal, legal maxims which are kind of things that are developed over time which are kind of rules for how things are put together that self, not either self-evident rules but through hundreds of thousands of years of law or kind of a truisms essentially mm. so the word includes is a legal maxim and that's clue <clears throat> that's included within this latin term inclusio unius est exclusio alterius. I don't speak Latin. You did it very well. <laughs> Evidently, it means including one is excluding all others. Now, this is a really slippery, um, slippery word because it's used an awful lot in acts and statutes. And it's a way of essentially making us think, Joe Bloggs think one thing when they're really doing another. Mm. So let me just uh, move on to the next slide. So that maxim um, defined in the kind of the legal dictionaries is when one or more things of a class are express expressly mentioned 
others of the same class are excluded. I don't know if that sounds a bit kind of strange to you. Well, it does sound odd that uh, some things are and some things aren't, and I'm sure you're going to define that. <laughs> this doctrine decrees that the law expressly describes a particular situation to which it shall apply. So an irrefutable inference must be drawn that what is omitted or excluded was intended to be omitted or excluded. So that's Black's Law Dictionary. So essentially, when they use the word includes, it's quite a definite and deliberate um, yes. device for what there comes after it. So you've got an example here. So I think the thing about it is that the example here, if I've used, is fruit includes apples. Now, I think our mind will think of the word includes there as a kind of uh, it's a kind of an expansion of the ideas. So fruit includes apples, but it also in our mind kind of includes all other classes of fruit, like oranges, pears, apples, yes. bananas. So I think that's our natural kind of. But in a, in a in an Oxford English Dictionary way of prose, we would be going, yeah, that's that's all right, isn't it? Because fruit does include yeah. apples. It's but in the murky legalese world, it's obviously got a different connotation. It has, and I think that's the problem. Um, the, the actual legal definition of it is a contraction rather than an expansion. So anything, Interesting. So anything that comes after the word includes, um, that's all it includes. It doesn't right. That might so, be in the head. Yeah, so if it had said something along the lines of, um, I don't know, a, a tree, um, a... Um, no, hang on, I'm just trying to think now. It, uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. So it's only the thing afterwards uh, and includes apples. It's it's effectively saying, forget the rest that you've just read. It's this last thing that's part of it. Yes. So basically at the bottom, um, the legal reading of that fruit includes apples is fruit is only apples. It's nothing else because all other classes, as per the legal maxim, are excluded. So you can see how that almost flips what our reading of something is on its head. Right. So so if you were to say something like the the basket has oranges, bananas, um, and also all sorts of other fruit, including apples, effectively it means the basket's only got apples in it. That's right. Even <laughs> though even though they've sort of mentioned these other elements of fruit. Yes, and you'll think you'll think in a way, so what? Um, yeah, but there are some examples later on which are and they, quite drastic in terms of what meaning it has. So if we kind of go back to the Interpretation Act, we've got the definition as person includes a body of persons, corporate or unincorporate. Now, not only we've got kind of think about what the word includes mean, but also in the Interpretation Act, um, there's a section there where it says that words in the singular include the plural and words in the plur plural include the singular so you've kind of got almost a double negative going on there and also you're not quite sure whether the word include there is being used in its legal maxim sense or in its common usage sense and i think uh so uh because it doesn't say so that's the problem mm. Um, mm. and i think because they know that the whole system is built on these couple of words, that they deliberately leave things a little bit murky um, for the purposes of a judge later on possibly dis making a decision for himself on the bench. Mm. Uh, you're wrong. But um, in, if you want to try and interpret that, you'll say person is a body corporate or unincorporate. Yeah. If the body of persons is plural, but it says include things in the plural include the singular, which means things in plural are or is the singular. So I have to reverse that meaning. You see what I mean? See how it's Yeah, different? yeah. No, yeah, no, I do get that. I hope we're not getting too technical, but... No, no, I, I mean, I think this is uh, an eye-opener for a, a number of people. Yeah, so, okay, that's kind of where I got to, because I'm, you know, essentially that's uh, a few hours of trying to get to a meaning of something, which you think would be quite simple. Um, but, oh, no. So if we just go to the next slide, I couldn't find 
in the statutes a definition of the body corporate or body unincorporate. Um, obviously, I haven't read every act that's ever been drafted, but... Um, you haven't? I haven't. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I've barely read the ones that I've actually looked at. So um, I, I think uh, if anyone knows or could help, um, especially lawyers, um, you know, it'd be, it would be nice to... Uh, yes. Know where get the goes. full meaning of what that is yeah because essentially they're given a, a definition that includes words but then those words in themselves are kind of technical so you have to go well what does those words mean if we yes want? so anyway if we move on to the next slide i thought well okay can we find a general definition for the terms I, in the oxford dictionary of law i couldn't find the term body corporate which online which was weird um but essentially uh, say an Oxford reference, it tells you what you think it is, which is essentially a corporation. Right. And in the Oxford Dictionary of Law, an unincorporated body is an association that has no legal personality distinct from its members. So essentially with a company, um, the company has its own kind of legal um, personality separate to the people, to its shareholders and its officers and such like. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So if we go back to the council tax liability to pay, based on what it actually says, and in terms of the definition, um, the only persons liable to pay council tax are corporations and unincorporated associations, which you could leave it there, because essentially, mm. you know, the Interpretations Act tells you that these definitions exist. That's the meaning. That's the meaning, unless it's specified in the act itself, which I couldn't see. Because sometimes right. what they do is they set out a definition, and then in the in a in an individual act, they'll say, "Well, just for the purposes of this act, this word means this." So it's right. a, it's a kind of localized definition just for that act. So does that mean real people? Well, we're not really real people, but okay. Does it include us? I don't know. So let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> this is not like i said before this is um not a remedy but i'm just no we're just trying to find out really who they're talking to so I yes thought, okay let's try hmrc because obviously we're talking we're in the realm of corporations um and in their tax manual they explicitly say there's no definition of the word board of corporate which is i find fairly unbelievable really um so they just say there is no modern definition of body corporate and the act of incorporation, which applies to both bodies corporate and corporations sole, is ancient, which is a kind of just a statement of fact, really. But um, yeah, Mazars, which are, I think are kind of auditors um, in reference to the Criminal Finance Act, said the term body corporate is not defined within that act and in no other tax legislation that we've reviewed. Which right. uh, which is odd. So essentially, you, you, kind of the trailers start to run dry quite quickly, in terms of who who is a person, and um, all they're saying is that um, the HMRC, HMRC um, say that there is no definition of body corporate, although it appears to mean a legal person distinct from its members. So we're uh, kind of back into the realm of corporation again, really. Um, so. There's a kind of, there's no formal, as far as I could see in a statute, no formal definition, but they're kind of informally giving you a definition. I don't know how far that, that could run. Mm. But anyway, if I can, we can whiz through. And uh, <laughs> I thought, okay, well, um, let's try HMRC through VAT. They go back to the original Interpretation Act, 1978, um, with the same definition. But they then kind of muddy the waters by saying there are, two types of person, legal persons and natural persons. So um, they're using different terminology, uh, not the body corporate or unincorporate. So again, where are we? It's getting more murky rather than more clear. Yes. Uh, so a legal person seems to cover the corporation side, um, uh, including a corporate body, which is like a company, and a corporation's soul, which um, I'll come on to. And then on the other side, it's got natural persons, which you think is us, mm. but it's not. It's an unincorporated society. Oh, I see. Right. So you can see where it's getting very confusing already. Yes. Okay. 
So, on the legal corporation soul side, um, a corporation soul is an individual person who represents an official position. Um, ah. So the death of the individual will not affect the corporation as there is a right of succession. So it kind of starts to make some sense. So they've put the crown, bishops, deans, vicars, and the Lord Mayor of London are examples of a corporation's soul, um, which you kind of start to understand. Yes, well, you know, Lord Mayor of London changes person, but the actual role itself stays the same. So yes. we kind of in one particular way. Um, but, you know, when you do some other research, you start to find out that the crown isn't a guy with a crown on his head. It's something else. So who are they talking about? Are they talking about the king? Or are they talking about something else here? Um, and if the crown is the surname, which also has rights of succession from father to son, as it were, or, you know, father to daughter, or to mm. father, but from father to son, um, it kind of qualifies for that definition to a point. Um, but obviously, somebody who's got better legal training than me, I don't have any legal training, but if somebody's got some knowledge that can clarify that, uh, as far as I can see, that kind of starts to draw in us as individuals a little bit more okay okay <laughs> it sounds mad okay next one so who is really the incorporated person is it us through the incorporation of our christian names uh with our surnames so um you know if you look at your birth certificate the birth certificate will show your christian names or four names or given names, I think sometimes they obviously change over time. Uh, but in a separate box, it will have in capital letters. And I think they've changed this recently, but certainly on mine and others of its period, the surname will always be in capital letters. Uh, and that's the father's name. Mm. So uh, the conjunction of those two, some people have kind of said, well, You've got the Christian names, which is the son. You've got the surname, which is the father's name, which is the father. So the state birth certificate, which draws the two together, is the Holy Ghost, could be could be said. So essentially, it's a kind of fiction that uh, uh, appears on paper, but isn't real. So, right. And kind of travels around in, in, in a way that a spirit would. So um, the only reason I'm kind of mentioning that is because that kind of theological side of things is where it comes from in terms of uh, it's kind of copyright, copyrighted to the Vatican. So they're responsible for this system, essentially. Um, so you can never kind of take some of the kind of theological elements out of it. Um, they're right. Always, they're not at the fore. So, yeah, um, as you'll see, the Christian names are always in upper and lower case. Yep. And... Very often, like you see on the letters, your surname will be in all capitals. Capitals, yeah. Now, the kind of research on capital letters in themselves is a kind of strange thing in itself because legally there is an argument that the capital letters, um, we're taught to read them and, they, and capital letters individually form part of English. So we can read John Henry there. Um, because it's got capital letters amongst it. Um, but for the most part, English is made up of initial capital letters with lowercase. So, and, and, and lowercase, so I think that's called title case. So it's a, it's a mixed language, um, but it's not a language of capital letters together. Mm. Um, it's quite technical, but it's in kind of legal terms, a, a name all in capital letters isn't in English. It's else. yes, that's that is my understanding. Yeah, it's kind of hieroglyphics more than real words. It's hieroglyphic. It's they're basically they become signs. Yes. Yeah. But it's very difficult because we kind of recognise the same signs as English, so we just read them. Yeah, uh, and that is and the, make make an assumption. And we make an assumption, which we always do. So uh, yeah. let's move on to the next one. Um, uh, okay, so as you can see, with, essentially with, with those two names, Create and Joinder, this is the kind of 
what I've seen um, is the system. It's a dual register system. So it's a bit like accounting, double entry bookkeeping, which is uh, one on side is the living and the other side is the dead. And um, John Henry is the living. And as you'll see that from your birth certificate, you're the kind of living child. Um, and it's joined to your father's name, um, which is the all capitals surname. So mm. as you see at the bottom right, you'll have a combination of the two that forms up what our state birth certificate. So that state birth certificate includes the date of birth and the registration date. But the trick really is, um, and this is kind of, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent really here, but from what I've seen, what I've learned, that there are, that system is a dual system and there are two certificates. Um, I don't know if you know anything about this. Yes, I yeah. have, um, I've done a bit of, I mean, I hadn't spoken about it on the show, but you've got the certificate that I think the midwife signs, which has the surname on, because you may not have got a name for your child. Um, and I forget what that's called. And then you have the final one, which you've got the the forename and or Christian name and middle name if you're having one. Yes, I think, <clears throat> so what happens is we, you know, the, the mother and father is informants kind of fill in the fill in the form and um we are registered or birthed as a vessel so but that surname is kind of created or that joinder is created at a date of birth or date of birthing so you know we kind of we in our mind we've all got our date of birth um but uh that was the date that our kind of fiction was birthed or born right so the date that you were actually you popped out of the womb and the date that you're registered are, are two different dates and yes. obviously um yes. and, and 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 i think they're legally allowed to be something like 40 days apart or something that's right um <clears throat> but up to 40 days somebody who's who's actually who's kind of managed to get hold of both certificates is that um essentially uh the Christian names uh, are on a separate certificate um, with a registration date. So basically, when you phone up for your birth certificate, uh, they'll say, what's your name and your date of birth? And you'll give all those date details that are on the certificate too there, that are on the bottom right-hand bottom right -hand corner. So we'll say, well, this is our name mm. and my date of birth is, you know, but uh, and they will go and get that particular certificate. Um, but there is another certificate, evidently, um, where if you just give your um, Christian names and the registration date, um, that will be a completely different certificate, and that will be the living person certificate. Wow. But the, the complication really is that to a degree, if you go after that, um, in a way, you've got to decide whether you're in the system or out of it. So, I would, you know, I haven't done it, but you've got to. I think you've got to be a little bit careful because obviously the system's got good things and bad things about it. Um, but from what I've understand, my understanding of it is that, that this two system, parallel system works. You know, and we're just un always or unaware of one side. Yes. And you can see that from the, how the words work. It's a kind of. You can see how that this kind of parallel system is essentially the kind of template for how all of this is working um, right and you can see who's at the heart of it and um the two keys um the trust system which i don't know if you've come across yeah the history of the trust was really that it would have two key holders so um you'll have one key for one side and another key for another or you'd require two people with each with a key to to open the box with the money in so you know, that's a kind of a form of protecting the trust from one person kind of going in and taking the money. So, I mean, you know, at its... But, so a trustee and the beneficiary, presumably. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure of that, but I do know that, you know, if in, in terms of a wooden box with things in it, um, mm. it had two two locks with two, or one lock with two keys. I don't know, it would have been two locks. So two, yeah. two 
in Oxford 2K. So. And I think they had that in parish churches as well. I'm not 100% sure, but I seem to remember they would keep, obviously, uh, important documents and things, and they had to have two keys in order to open it. Oh, right, OK. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, that's obviously where that comes from. OK, so uh, if we go on. If you kind of, oh, if you just go back one, you'll just see from the dual register... Uh, symbology at the back that um, they're playing around with that kind of crucifix idea as well. So oh, yeah. that's always mm. there in the background. I've put that there, but you can see the dual register, essentially what they... Uh, On the keys themselves. And the keys, what they allude to, yeah. So that's there, but uh, <clears throat> as you'll see, that idea of a kind of two parallel systems um, might make things a bit clearer if we just move on to the next slide. So I put the matrix there. You know, we all watched the film, and obviously when we watched it, probably... I must be the only one who's never seen it. <laughs> now no. I'm refusing to see it because I don't <laughs> want to know. But anyway. I, yeah, I mean, essentially, um, it kind of describes... There are also claims for what it's about, but really it's, 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 it's describing this system, this dual system, where a real person goes, goes into a, a fictional world and um, the matrix, obviously the, the original meaning of the word is a womb. So you can see mm. it's about how we're birthed, in which world are, are we birthed into. So um, I found this quite useful way of kind of knowing where you are and what things are. So I've kind of put some terms that I've come across in two different uh, columns, you know, and I kind of picked this up from a, a guy called Bill Turner, who's just brilliant at this kind of thing. Um, so this dual entry ledger, you can see on one side, there's the living and then on the other side is the dead. And in terms of terminology, you can then start to quickly understand some of the terms that we kind of just think are plain English, but they're mm. legal terms and they place this in one side of the ledger or the other. So you'll see on the right hand side, you know, things like um, um, you'll see on there's a kind of private ledger. And there's a public ledger. So essentially, the living person's on the private ledger, but we never go there because the moment we're born and registered, we're instantly transported onto the into the public register. Um, so we're not in in a way we're never really on that left hand side on, on the private side. Um, but some of the kind of terminology is applicable to one side and not the other. So yeah. as you see. Um, child might be on on the living side and stillbirth child might be on the other now, that seems obvious but you'll we'll see in a later slide if we can, <laughs> if you can kind of stick with it um that that's actually quite important because that's a way that we're moved from one side of the ledger to the other now one person that i've, I've seen says that um that when we're born, there are two elements that are born. There's a live, there's a living child if it's living, mm. and, but there's a placenta as well, and um, that's 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 birthed. And that what happens is that the placenta is pronounced dead uh, on birth, and what we do is we joined her to that dead thing thereafter. Right. So, so that dead thing is birthed and given a surname in capital letters and becomes a corporation with a birth certificate. And then we joined it to that. Oh, I see. That's very really clever, that, yeah. Yes. Whether that's true or not, I'm not entirely sure. But, I um, know that some people would say that child, uh, it should be in the uh, in the public and it would be ma it would be boy or girl in the private. But you, that's... Might, you, you might be right. And I'm... Um, well, you know, I'm more than open to these things being <laughs> revised. Um, it's just something I've been working on. It's very much a sure. work in progress, but it helps you understand where things stand. So if we yeah. know, if we know that capital letters are on one side and not the other, then we know absolutely. What to do. Yeah. And and just as a, as and, and as you were doing that, I was just looking there at lowercase and what have you. Anybody who's had an email reply from me will always know. I only put the first name. I only say uh, to whomever it is. Um, yes. I only re reply as Richard. I don't actually put um, a capitalized or any surname. Um, 
I have on of some occasions when I'm writing to, a, say, you know, a corporate type body um, with a link or something. But anybody who's e- emailed as a as a show viewer, um, I always reply as me uh, or what I feel me is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for the you most, know. it doesn't kind of change anything. But um, no, it just it's, kind of, it's, it's, it's personal. Just, yeah, it just kind of orientates you in that world and know what you're doing. I mean, I don't know what films you have watched, but on the left-hand side, you'll see that um, one side is born and one side is an identity. So, ah, think, born identity. You think about the born identity is somebody who didn't know his name. Right. Interesting. And, and only and had to kind of basically go back and find out who he was. So that those little kind of little clues, as it were, are kind of they're yeah. kind of they're little things that are kind of in the mainstream media to kind of in a way tell us but we again we can't read them because we can't read now i'm i'm gonna speed you up a little bit only because we're coming up to the end of now and i I know usually only a a lot an hour but i do want to get to the end of this but i'm gonna just uh, (laughs) wind you up a bit but you know I, i don't want to miss anything i've put a lot in so i should have probably edited some of that no no you carry on Let's whip through it. Um, okay. So essentially, on the public side, it only, government only de- deals, its statutes only regulate businesses, not real people. So yeah. everyone on that public side is presumed when they're born to be doing business. So that essentially, when we go back to that bank council tax legislation, as a person, we're presumed to be in commerce. In commerce. So therefore, yeah. we come under that legislation. Okay, let's go on. Um, I think in terms of um, the sister QV trust thing, we can possibly go into another day. But essentially, as our, when we're born, we're kind of born dead. Yeah. So that's how we become a corporation. Um, and because we're born dead or presumed dead at birth. And we, and don't, we don't claim ourselves. We have no will, so our estate is then probated and administered on our behalf. Essentially, yeah. so that trust there is being administered because we're presumed dead until we actually die. And and our mum and dad could have done that if they knew, but they yes. don't because they've yeah. had the same bloody thing done to them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So next slide. So how did they make us dead? Well, we go back to the word includes again. Ah, the sneakies. <laughs> Now, I haven't found this in the UK legislation. Um, it's just a time thing, really. I'm sure it's there somewhere, but it, it's not in the Interpretation Acts. So it's placed in another act, if you want to go through all the hundreds of acts there are. But as an example, in a Scottish Act, uh, 1965, Registration of Births, Deaths and Marriages, uh, in this act, birth includes a stillbirth. Look at that. And we know that includes means it is a stillbirth. It is a stillbirth. So that's how they make you dead. Gosh, look at that. Yes. So next one. Uh, In Australia, um, again, birth includes a stillbirth and child includes or is a stillborn child. So yeah. So the purpose. but Sorry, I was just going to say that reference I said about child might have been correct then about the fact that it should have been in the other column, only because it now says their child is a stillborn child rather than living boy so, or girl. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what the real living term is. Yeah. But you can see how it's flipped by that word includes. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Um, on the next one, um, so under these acts, it means you can only register a still. Oh, a, a, a stillbirth. <laughs> child. That's that's a that is a, a baby that's been born on a windowsill, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. In a um, um, so your uh, your birth in a legal death, essentially, um, and your birth certificate is really your death certificate. Good God, yeah, it's a bit depressing. That is, okay, that is. Next one. So includes is the word that makes you dead, and it's also been used to move countries. So has it. We'll quickly move this on. So for all acts, where is Australia? Mm. So Australia means the Commonwealth of Australia uh, when used in a geographical sense, and it includes Norfolk Island. 
Um, so that's where it really is then. So yes, if you go on to uh, the ninety, well, at the bottom, the nineteen seventy five Act, which I think was um, an update of the one of it, it solely includes Norfolk Island. So uh, if you go on to the next slide, um, you can see where Norfolk Island is. So wow. So essentially, I think it was Cook discovered it, and it was claimed under Terra Nullius, which was, you know, it was un uninhabited, so they claimed it. And then in 1973, all the Australian nationals were changed to citizens, and they were moved onto, you see the orange kind of uh, shelf around. Mm. Uh, they were, um, at, in terms of administration, moved into that area and off the land, um, and that area, the EEZ, the Exclusive Economic Zone, was then administered and managed from Norfolk Island. So, uh, which is probably, is Australia, but in capital letters, so it's a corporation. So the real, the real Australia itself, you know. The landmass. The landmass and its kind of real government mm. are kind of temporarily ab abandoned and everything now is corporately administered from Norfolk Island. Good heavens. Yeah. So you can see how you can see how important the word includes is. Yes. Wow. Absolutely. What was that it? I can't remember now. Oh, there was one. Uh, so the purposes of the IRS. Now, I read a very interesting book by a guy called Peter Hendrickson, who basically took on the IRS and the whole case uh centered around the word includes so um wow again and that went to the supreme court and they fudged it um they just basically uh they just made it up on the spot essentially um and disagree with them but really in terms of legislation um it goes to the very heart of whether who was liable to pay uh income tax uh and in the United States, income tax was originally only set up to be paid for by uh, employees of the government. It included only employees of the government. Huh. And, then, and then what happened is that they've kind of fudged it and tried to pretend that everyone else is liable for it as well. But in terms of the US Re Revenue Code, and I think this is the last slide. Uh, There's one more after this. All right, the United States, in a geographical sense, includes the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa. <laughs> so the United States for tax purposes, or URS, isn't the United States. So it does, which I suspect, I think the money goes to Puerto Rico. This one I found recently, um, which is very peculiar, and I can't really find out the purpose of the act. It was an order that was issued by the Queen from Buckingham Palace and it's related to a, um, a social security arrangement with the United States and the United Kingdom. Why there would be such an arrangement, I don't know, because I couldn't find out why. Some people I've seen have said that essentially social, some social security payments are going to the United Kingdom from the, from the US. Um, but, you know, it needs a bit more research on this. But from, from the order, which was then kind of, embedded into an act you can see for the purposes of this agreement sorry just trying to get this last slide to show a hundred percent all right at the bottom there um on on the bottom which for some reason this one that's has, just yeah it's one. just so slow that one yeah so the united kingdom shall include the isle of man the island of jersey and the islands of guernsey alderney herm and jethu which are just small channel islands so what it's saying basically is that um, whatever's happening with this USA Social Security money or arrangement is not going through the United Kingdom, as we understand it. It's going through those islands, which are all crown dependencies. Wow. Uh, so um, you can only kind of guess as to what's happening there. So it's uh, fascinating. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. You, you can kind of, obviously, you can see the power of the meaning of a word, really. Um, so well, that, that, 
Absolutely. And you've, you've shown us some fa- really interesting and fascinating things. And the word includes, which I mean, you, you know, people can t- just now look at any of the legalese paperwork that comes and see what it really means. And of course, the word person and the word you, which I think was fascinating yeah. um, as, as well, as well as all well, the whole thing was um, was every day is a learning on, on this show, I can tell you. I think they're kind of academic to a point. But I think the thing that is of value is you know, whether you regard things as goods and whether you let somebody take your house away. So, you know, in practical yeah. terms, just look yeah. more, you know, for your viewers, if you're in trouble, just look at what the bank has really got an interest in. Unfortunately, the time has sort of whizzed by, uh, by but it'd be interesting to look at the uh, the logos in another one if you're up for uh, putting another presentation together, Paul. Yes, um, I will. I think it would be a lot, uh, a lot more kind of visually interesting i mean this yeah was no but no 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 that was interesting that was fascinating and um i, I mean some people wouldn't will have known aspects of it um yeah. other people would be new to the whole lot and some people be new to you know to various bits of it um so no don't uh, that was really interesting and very useful um and it gives us all a whole new perspective on things so really enjoyed that um thank you so much for coming on and uh, and putting the presentation together that was really good um very much appreciate it so there that's my pleasure um i'll be back with more monologues and more wonderful interviews and hopefully we'll get paul to come back and do something on logos which will be interesting another insight what do they put in them that makes us uh, we can be more aware as we wander down the street or get these leaflets and things through the post and we can be um a bit more cautious about who we deal with and how we deal with them depending on the words but in the meantime from now Uh, For now, uh, from Paul and I, thanks so much for watching. Goodbye.